Casual Magic has been brought to you by Cool Stuff Inc., where you can get cool stuff. Use the code CASUAL to get 5% off of your sale. And then also by Coalesce Apparel, where you can get really cool t-shirts and stuff. And use the code Casual Magic to get 10% off your sale. And by Architect, a deck hosting website that doesn't really sell anything, but they like me and I like them. So kindly use them. And now, on to the show. Hello and welcome to Casual Magic, the show where we talk about the fun side of Magic the Gathering. My name is Shivan Putt and Casual Magic is brought to you by Cool Stuff Inc., Architect, and Coalesce Apparel and Design. Today, for episode two of my video venture, uh, I have brought on my dear friend Jim Lepage, who is brand new member of the Rules Committee after coming into the CAG last year and, like, I guess leapfrogging over me. Um <laughs> But honestly, when we were approached and we in the CAG were asked, like, who should be on the RC? The three people that I said were Olivia, Jim, and uh, someone else. And not me, not me, just to prove it, because, like, it's really gosh to actually nominate yourself for these things. That's kind of just <laughs> cheese ball. And, like, it's weird. But also there are people who are better suited for that half of the role than I am. Um, however... I was super thrilled when I when we discovered that it was going to be you and Olivia, Jim, because I think that you're one of the most brilliant minds in Commander in terms of, well, I mean, okay, next to me. But, <laughs> 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 well, actually, what I mean, though, is that you've got a very level, calm approach to things and a way, a, a reasoned approach, and that you actually sit and think about what we're talking about consider it within the spectrum of commander up and down and um, are a lot less uh, given to popping off than let's say me. <laughs> popping off is tempting. I'm not like, I'm not going to lie to you. It is. It's all the, all the time. It's it's tempting all the time, but uh, oh, yeah. we, we have such like a flood of stimuli, you know, it's just like a constant fire hose that's trained at us as, as like content creators or even just as magic players. Right. And mm -hmm. it can be tempting to like want to turn the fire hose back at our own communities. <laughs> <laughs> that like, is the yeah. wrong thing to do though. Like, yeah, I mean, you, you can speak to this as well as I can, which is that since joining the CAG, I have learned so much respect. I mean, I've gained so much respect for the RC because like, holy crap, the kind of crap that they just get flung at them 25 hours a day is ridiculous. It's like, you lose a game and immediately go and find like Toby's Twitter and be like, you killed my puppy or something. And it's just like, whoa, 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 <laughs> chill. Or like, you know, every move we take or don't take is the end of commander and the death of magic. And we are at fault for all sins. And it's like, oh, they've been dealing with this for like 20 years. That's insane. Yeah, it can be pretty tough to watch too. Cause like, you know, you go to a, a YouTube channel or something like that, and people are playing Commander or whatever, and somebody plays a Dockside Extortionist or whatever. And then there's just like instantly a thread being like, oh, the rules committee is a bunch of idiots. I can't believe this card's legal in the format, blah, blah, blah. And personal, personal attacks against oh, yeah. people. <laughs> and it's just like, man, can you guys chill? Like, I get that people are passionate about the game and people have differing opinions and of what should be and what shouldn't be, but like, Personal attacks are, you know, you could probably not do that and still accomplish what you want to accomplish. You, you know, you know <laughs> it's one of the, the skills I've learned from the decades on the Internet has been you can attack an idea or you can attack a concept or a corporation or even just like an abstract kind of figure without attacking the people within it. And you can be constructive and still be angry. Like, it's fine to be angry about Dockside. It's fine to be angry about, I don't know, Magic 30 or whatever it is that we're mad about. But direct your anger in a way that is productive and that aims it at the actual people who... Like, getting mad at, like, the community managers is a waste of your time and just negative life for everybody, right? Like... I find the other thing that doesn't get enough <laughs> enough uh, airtime is um, save your, your outrage for the stuff that is outrageous. Right. You know? Um, because I find that a lot of people like, uh, Olivia and I, uh, uh, say this to each other quite a bit. And that's like, 
If somebody spills a glass of milk and they instantly burst into tears, it's not about the milk. No, right? it's you not. can be a hundred percent certain about that. And there's definitely these days this like undercurrent of anxiety about where the game's going, about where it's gone. Um, and and people are looking to plant that flag wherever they can. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it's just really misplaced and it makes it really easy for people to dismiss legitimate concerns when you plant that flag on things that don't matter. <laughs> yes, um, that is so true. Cause like you, what you're doing is you're spending all of your fuel and like, you're just lighting everything on fire. And when everything is on fire, you can't tell which fire you need to be putting out. Right. Right. It's like, you know, if you've ever, I know you've worked in, in, in games and stuff like that, but like, I don't know if you've ever been in an environment where, you know, your superiors classify everything as a priority one. Exactly. It's like, that's cute, but <laughs> you know, okay, you well, gotta pick some stuff that's not gonna get done. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, ultra top secret <laughs> priority. Like, I, we're running out of colors here, buddy. Buddy, like which one's a mauve right. priority, right? But, <laughs> I mean, it, the, the, what you bring up though is so valid because it reminds me of what happened with uh, Walking Dead, right? Like where, when you when people are like think about that two week explosion of just insanity that hit the community, you had to think about like what was going on. It was like a week before the most contentious election in American history. It was a week. It was like six seven months into like the full lockdown pandemic time. Mm-hmm. So we're deep in the heart of everything. We're about around the corner from like holiday season. There's psycho town election going on. Everybody is just like full of intense anxiety and rage has nowhere to point it and then wizards comes out and says hey we're just making a promotional product that has nothing to do with anything hi guys did you remember the walking dead and everyone's like you know and yep it's literally just when you've got that much pressure built up any valve will just lead to a full explosion yep 100 percent, and 100 percent. oftentimes like i remember a lot of the things like like when toby calls me the tank of the rc right like and they were like uh, effectively, the RC was an ivory tower that we didn't know or couldn't really contact. I mean, they were there, but we didn't think about. The CAG came, and then there was me, the loud guy. And so they're like, okay, mm-hmm. we can't get to the big thing. We can't get to the small thing, but we can get to this dude who's just here and available and just mm-hmm. vent all of our anxiety and anger and frustration at him. And luckily, that's one of the things I excel at and enjoy. So I'm willing to sit there and translate that into actionable material. But it's also something that's very difficult, both for me, for you, and for all of us to sit there and be the mouthpiece of this kind of product when, especially when people have so much attachment to Commander and to their decks and to like the thing that is ruining their one chance for enjoyment in life or whatever. And I don't know, it's wild. It's this position we put ourselves this. in is really different. <laughs> some of them expect us, I, I found that a lot of people expect me to be an apologist for a lot of things. Yeah. Like, um, but I mean, like, I, I don't agree with everything that Watsi's done in the last little while. I, I definitely don't think I would go as far as a lot of people go. But um, there are some things that I don't like that, that Watsi's done in the magic space in the last little while. Um, but also, you know, you kind of got to put it in perspective, right? Like, is this something I'm going to care about next year? Maybe not. <laughs> next set? Ne- yeah, you know, next right? week? <laughs> yeah. And so, like... Yeah, I think that there there's definitely a lot of anxiety about a lot of magic stuff and a lot of non-magic stuff that right. tends to come out in these kinds of conversations. But um, yeah, that that's kind of the trick, right? Is to find that perspective and to make sure that um, that you're planting the flag on on something that like is within your control. Well, I, sorry, when I when I say from like a rules committee perspective, is within my control and um, is a fight that's worth fighting, right? right? Like, we also don't want to make sure that we're planting this flag on stuff that's going to totally politically kneecap us in the future and prevent us from being able to affect positive change down the road. Mm-hmm. We don't want to destroy business relationships with, you know, people that we've got business relationships with and all that kind of thing. So I shouldn't say business relationships, like professional relationships. Yes. Um, like, because it's not a, it's not a transaction it's, thing. It's, it's not a, it's a transaction a, relationship, but it is a professional relationship. It is a, a mutually beneficial relationship between, you know, these parties here. Because like you guys want Commander to thrive because it's our baby format and Watsi wants Commander to thrive because it's the most popular way to play Magic and it's in everyone's interest to make sure that they're not putting out cards that are going to break our format and that we're not like banning stuff that's going to, I don't know, just like 
upend the way that they do business. Right? Yeah, and that's not going to make people feel bad about buying right stuff. Right, it's, it's the Lutri principle, right? Like exactly, we banned Lutri Day Zero because it sucks, and we don't want to do that. We we nobody wanted that, but what we definitely didn't want was someone going to pre-release, dropping fifty bucks for a foil Lutri, and coming home and finding out on Monday that it's banned. Yeah. Oh, I have a full art Japanese Lutri that I pulled because my my LGS got in Japanese packs on um, on like a release day. And I'm like, oh, I'll buy a pack. And I opened a full art Japanese Lutri and it's actually gorgeous. It is, <laughs> I'm like, st- it is so frustrating <laughs> how beautiful that card is. Yeah. Yeah. I like, been I've been, I've been <laughs> kind of like knocking it around in my head. I'm like, where can I play this? Because like, I don't know. Can when I come you? across stuff like that, where I want to play it, I just play it. I, I have actually never had somebody say no. No, because to... commander players by and large don't yeah. care. Yep. As long as you're doing something cool with it, right? Like, um, I know you talked about Al- you talked about this with Alex with Rule Zero, uh, and we talked about it. We did a spike on the mic about Rule Zero decks. Um, but as long as you're doing it as a creative exploration of what's possible in the format, and not like I want to play Rafelos in my green deck because it'll make it two turns faster. You know, <laughs> like as long as you have a good reason for it, you're just like I just like otters, and everybody is like, great, let's see your otter deck. Yeah, like right? seriously. All right, rules committee, let's figure out how to ban companion so we can have Lutri back or just ban Lutri as companion because God, that card is just fine. It is mm-hmm. medium at best. They just made a mistake by giving it the... Honestly, I am still angry at Wizard of the Coast for deliberately doing something that they knew we would have to ban right away because they came to us and said like, hey, this card is probably going to need to be banned in your format. I'm like, hey, why is it an otter? B... Why there's is that the only thing you could find to trigger it that every card has to be unique in your deck? You there's and no you, other and the art is gorgeous. Yeah, it's the art is beautiful. Gorgeous. It, <laughs> if it had been an elemental or a goat or an ooze or a donkey or who knows, nobody yeah. would have cried about it. If it looked like freaking um the red black one, which is just spikes and sadness, like whatever. Oh, Obosh? I have one handy. Here's, here's one I prepared earlier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, seriously, though, it's just like you guys set us up to just get punched in the face, and that's not yeah. fair. Yeah. Um, but yeah. like it's it's wild. I mean, I didn't mean to start us off on such a somber note right off the bat, but it is this is sort of the th- sort of thing that you have to deal with when we were in a position of uh public facing responsibility and you have just recently been upgraded from hey you know what it's not my fault i don't ban any cards i just make recommendations to oh i do ban cards and it is my fault (laughs) i said that to somebody the other day i'm like look man i don't make the rules oh wait and everybody was like oh (laughs) guess what (laughs) but tell me Uh, that day like okay so yeah for the for the purposes of Okay, we'll we will go forward and then go backwards. The day you found out that they were going to like, they were asking you to join the rules committee. What was that like? Um, it was a lot. Um, well, okay. So, uh, are you talking about the day that they like actually offered me the spot, yes. or the day that they said, you know, hey, we want to interview for it? No, well, the day you um, want the spot, like the day you got it, got it. We'll go back and do the interviews in a minute. But I want to know what was that emotion like when you're like, oh. I'm in charge now. <laughs> it was a lot. Like, I, I'm not going to, so I don't think I've told anybody. I, I told Olivia this because Olivia and I um, are fairly this, close and we yeah. talk about a lot. But, um, like, I, throughout the whole process, I, I was very unsure that I was doing the right thing. And maybe maybe to some extent, I'm still not 100% sure um, that it's the right thing. My main concerns were, um, I have a lot of demands on my time. Mm. Uh, and that's, uh, comes from being a content creator and all that kind of thing. And that can be a tough thing to balance. Uh, you know, I, I do have a full-time job. This is my, you know, this the, is a the spike spike feeders is my second job. Cause it is a business, you know, mm-hmm. um, like I claim it on my taxes, uh, you know, Oh, you're a step farther than I am. <laughs> oh, shoot. You got in on that. That's, that's like better than a sponsorship is writing stuff off. I wrote off my basement right now. Cause it's where we film. We're going to need to talk about this afterwards. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, like, um, yeah. So you've got, you're, you're an adult. You have things. Yes. Mm-hmm. Life is hard. And we're not obviously like, you know, the RC who are a bunch of older guys who are very set in their lives and can make room. And t- I mean, 
mind you, it's wild that Toby and Gavin can do this while still having like very high intense jobs. Like, yeah, Shelton being a house hunt, then okay, yeah, you can fiddle around with Commander, it's not a problem. But like, yeah, you have a real job and a uh, uh-huh. like a life. So yeah, I'm like, and I'm lucky because my job is pretty flexible. I work from home. I uh, I edit instructional videos for an insurance company. Um, <laughs> And good practice, I guess. Well, it's it's funny because magic was the practice for that. I actually didn't do this up until about eighteen months ago, uh, and then <laughs> I was on a project, and my project ended, and my VP came to me and said, "Hey, like your job's going away, but you're a permanent employee. So what do you want to do? Where do you want to go?" And I showed her one of our better known combo videos. It was better known combo Kiki Jiki combos, and I was like, "Here's the deal: you don't have to know anything about this game that we're playing, but I can do this for us." Hmm. Like I can say, cause we were developing a legacy system replacement and I said, we have to teach people how to new- use this new system that we just built. Hmm. Um, I can teach people how to, how to use the new system, but in one minute TikToks, basically. <laughs> um, and she loved it. And now that's what I do full time. That's so. insane. But yeah. also, I mean, mind you, it's very important to be able to take a very dry and like laborious subject like insurance and turn it into something that's actually uh digestible and understandable so that's yeah. that's a skill yep yep i think that's actually that's actually one of my my core skills that's when they asked me when i was joining when i was interviewing for the rules committee that was one of the questions that they asked me was what do i think is uh you know one of my um skills that i bring to this and and uh communicating complex concepts and breaking them down into their fundamental pieces i think is one of my one of my stronger points frankly that's the reason they got you onto the cag in the first place yeah because like you came into our awareness, and I say our because I didn't really know you before the Flash commentary, uh, because you had such a interesting and level-headed take on CDH and on Flash and on like Commander in a way that like made it less like you were just screaming at us and more like, oh, there's an actual premise here that we can explore, and there's an actual discussion to be had, and that's like incredibly uh, challenging skill to have that's an incredibly useful skill to have to be able to turn something that's so arcane into um something that we can actually action upon and yeah yeah and like i think that once you got on the cag and once you actually started like showing off more but even without the cag i think they would have probably still spoken to you just because of the the fact that you've shown the capability to do this um because, like, I know that they interviewed a handful of people, and obviously I'm not going to mention those names. Um, they were all good people from the folks I saw, and any Very. one of them would have been somebody I would have been super proud to work with. Um, I'm, I'm miffed that they didn't ask me, but also I fully understand why they didn't ask me, because I do not have the right mentality. I mean, not mentality, the right patient? No. I don't know. I pop off too much. <laughs> it's like... I'm not, I'm not even saying like a lot of people will, will talk about it as like a, like a next step or a next level, but I, I don't know. I don't necessarily know that it's like hierarchical like that in terms of like the skill sets involved. Right. Yeah. It's not like, it's not like Maslow's hierarchy of needs where it's like, this is the keg skill set and on top here, of that no. is the, you know, it's more like overlapping circles where there are a lot of useful skills that are useful in both roles, but yeah. there are some distinct things that are helpful in each. Um, and actually that's a very good point i think that the cag and the rc are not a an org chart they're not like it's not like right that there's one group here and they're superior to the other it's more that we on the cag have very important specific talents that are very that are like they come to me because they want to know my opinion about very specific things that i'm very good at and very like cognizant about and yep. that's a talent that's like worth keeping in the role that I'm in because I'm good at that. Mm-hmm. And like, for instance, like Olivia got promoted to the RC because one of the other things that she brings that people don't see is the fact that she is one of the greatest organizational minds in magic. Yes. In terms yeah, of just 100%. putting things together, getting things done, getting things organized out the door and like structured. And she's genius tier at that. Well, like <laughs> Olivia's worked on presidential presidential campaigns. Yeah. She's a community organizer. That's exactly community. it. She's an organizer. And, and yeah. for a community run object like Commander, you need somebody who's got that tendency, the ability to bring people in and give them work and give them like things to do. And I don't know, I think she's just a, yeah, like home run. That was the easiest yep. possible pick I think they could have made. Yeah. But, well, like, so with, with this sort of overlapping 
but like somewhat separate skill sets. It kind of touches on something that I've been thinking about for a long time, and I've been working on it for the past couple months, um, largely with Olivia and with Sheldon and and uh, and Rachel as well. Um, one of the questions that I really want to answer is, um, how do we know whether people are doing a good job, right? What does a good job look like, and how do we know whether we're doing that or not, mm. right? What is what is a good direction, and how do we know whether we're traveling in that direction? Um. And so that's like one of the things that I would love to in the next, like, let's say six months to a year is work out like, what is the role of the CAG mm. in ways where we can say, um, here are some things that you could do to be better at being on the CAG. Here are some things that you could do to be better at being on the RC, do or not do. Um, here's how you can approach things a little bit differently. Mm. If you want to go from, um, you know, being a, content creator or being a, a you know a commander um sheldon uses the term luminary to like being on the CAG or going to the rc or something like that how do you get there what's mm. that roadmap look like you know um what what are the skills you should work on if that's something that you want to do you listening at home you know um and what is expected of you what yes. are you supposed to, like what are we here for right like and i think one of the things we need to work on is being able to explain what it means when Sheldon goes out and plays saying there's no changes this year. Cause yeah. like that, that no changes you and I know took a lot of work to get to no changes, but to the audience at home, it's just like these lazy uh, like people are just sitting there and they're just like, eh, no changes. Okay. I'm just a clap machine now. And it's like, well, the funny thing about no changes too, is that, sometimes I found that people will describe um, ban list updates as no changes um, or like re not even ban list updates, but like uh, the, the, um, the updates that come out before each release that describe them as no changes when things actually change, right? We have to like <laughs> research and like, especially when it comes to new rules and stuff like that. Like, I mean, you were in the room when we talked about um, initiative. Yeah right? Or dungeons or attractions, all of this kind of stuff. It requires us actually researching the, in the comp rules, like the conversations that Charlotte and Toby and myself and, and a few of the other like rules wonks had about this stuff. We're pretty in depth because yeah. this is like new territory and we have to decide, is this going to work in commander? How does it work in commander? You know, do we need to draw a line to exclude it or do we need to draw a line to include it? Mm -hmm. And how do we do that? What's the most efficient way to make that, to craft that rule? And what happens to the format if we have three more cards in the command zone or if we have an extra side deck? Is there a difference between having an attractions deck that's acorned or unacorned or whatever versus having a contraptions deck? Is there a fundamental difference in like, like all of these things suddenly you, we have to like work on the actual structural integrity of the format and that's a lot of stuff that we don't share and that people don't see and therefore think we're not doing anything. And I want to share that stuff. <laughs> I mean, it's so, cause like those are some of the most fascinating conversations we have when like yeah, when Toby and Charlotte start just actually really going deep into the weeds about like corner case rules about random cards that are suddenly going to interact in ways that we can't even fathom. It is some of the greatest like discussion I've ever seen for magic just in terms of like, how will this come up? What would happen if it comes up? How do we resolve it if it comes up? And is this something that is even relevant to Commander? I don't know. I yeah. just, that's like the sort of thing that I find thrilling and I wish we were more transparent about. Well, so <laughs> you'll probably enjoy the stuff that I've been working on. <laughs> um, like what I what I want, what if you ask me like, what's, what's your ideal scenario for Commander? I would love to have... Um, a document, call it the philosophy, call it the philosophy document, call it whatever you want. I would love to have a roadmap for how to run the format, even just like conceptually, not like, you know, if this situation comes up, do that more like, uh, these are the core things that we care the most about. That's the philosophy. And then what are the strategies that we have for maintaining and improving that kind of environment where the philosophy can thrive? Mm. Right. And then what are the actual, nuts and bolts, everyday tasks that we're doing that are in service of our strategy that is maintaining our philosophy, you know? Like, I think that we stopped several steps short of that right now. And we have a, a few, like, 
somewhat nebulous concepts. Like we want things to be social or we want things to be memorable or whatever, right? But we don't say like, what are the things that we're actually doing to make it social? And what are the things we're actually doing to make it memorable? Because like there are some hallmarks of the format that are designed to encourage those things. Like higher life total is intended to encourage longer games. That's mm -hmm. something that we all know, but it's not in the philosophy. Yeah, document. like we need to do a better job of taking the unwritten expectations of Commander and writing them down. Yes. Like yeah. we shouldn't leave it to just people to ambiently absorb the idea that this is why the format exists like it is. It's got a hundred card limit for this reason. It's got, you know, we don't play wrath, I mean, like land destruction effects for that reason. You know, like not that we need to ban it or that we need to dictate what we're doing, but if we explain the fundamental buildings of blocks of what makes the format, then somebody can look at it and say like, okay, now I understand why I can choose to subvert it, ignore it, move with it, but at least I know what it is, right? And, and it also allows us to like, it allows us to assess what we're doing in terms of whether it actually accomplishes our goals, mm. right? So if we say like, we're going to ban this card and our intent for this is whatever change, like maybe not, maybe not a ban card. Cause usually the, the, the goal in banning a card is to remove that card from the, from yeah. the card pool. Right. But like the but, concept of signpost banned, for instance. Yeah. Is that something yeah. that works? Is that something that has meaning? Do people understand that? You know, like those are the heuristics yeah. that or not heuristics, but like statistics that we need to study and understand. What... Yeah. Or like, you know, when they, when they, uh, um, when they included companion, right. Mm. Like the, the rationale behind that change was it's breaking a commander rule and that's um, the hundred card deck building rule, as well as the wish rule that you can't uh, bring things in from outside the game. It broke, broke those two rules. Yep. Right. Um, and so the choice there was, <laughs> the choice there was um, allow it to work and figure out a way to do that. If there's some like easy and, and elegant way to allow it to work, the benefit that we get is it's encouraging people to make creative deck building, to, to self-impose creative deck building mm. restrictions, right? So it's in theory, encouraging the behaviors that we like to see. And that's people creatively exploring the format, using cards that aren't used very often, all that kind of stuff. Sure. Saying like, what would a deck look like if I could only use creatures or only use enchantments? Or what would a deck look like if I could only use three plus drops, you know? Um, I think I've seen most like actually honestly i think i've seen every command uh, every one of them except for actually no i have i've seen every single one of the legal uh companions being played for different reasons like karuga gigantha uh zag whatever the the wolf that's red and white that looks like firefox symbol oh yeah the basalt model yeah basalt model of friends <laughs> literally all it's used for is going into zerda basalt. zerda but yeah like because i was gonna say i'm like we should just remove the companion mechanic, but no, because it does serve a function. It's doing something good. Yeah. Right? Like Gigante so, is awesome. It's fine. Whatever. So, I mean, anybody can argue on whether the, whether like, you know, um, Josh always says, you know, is the juice worth the squeeze? Right. And it may not have been, but at least we can come out and say, this is what we're trying to accomplish. Right. Mm. We, we made this decision, but there's a reason for it. It's because it encourages something that we want to encourage philosophically. Um, and that all it cost us was bending this rule a little bit, right? The, the, the actual result of the companion change was adding one word yeah. to the wish rule. Other. Um, other. <laughs> can't bring in other cards from outside the game. And that's the same thing with dungeon and initiative. Mm -hmm. um, we added the term, uh, the word non-traditional. Um, <laughs> it's wild because like you think like, oh, that's not a big deal. But Toby had to work for months to get down yeah. to being able to do this in a way that's not going to break the fundamental rules of magic and make it into something that you can program on Mitgo or on, on any other service, actually make it into something that's viable and like written in rules lawyer ease, which is not easy. It's like, it's not intuitive yeah. to change the rules of magic. It is very, very difficult. Like, you know, it's, it's kind of funny because if you see people that are like really good at what they do, right? Mm. Like you go to a hockey game or you go to a, a basketball game or something like that and they make it look easy, right? Yeah. And you're like, oh yeah. Or like you're watching the Olympics, right? And you've got some gymnast that's out there doing like triple backflips and they're, you're like, oh, their knees came apart. That's going to be at least half a point off. And I'm <laughs> sitting here with Cheeto dust on my fingers, right? Yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's like you, you watch, your, have you ever seen a ref in a hockey game? Like yeah. those guys are gold medal mm -hmm. figure skaters by any stretch of the words because 
I remember I went to a shark museum once and the dude literally like, you know, the forward comes barreling at him. He's got the pucky slap shots. The ref literally just hops backwards onto the railing, lifts his leg up so the thing can go underneath, comes back and like does this just whole turn. And it's just part of not dying on the ice. And I'm like, yeah, yeah but, but that right there would have gotten you into silver medal contention. Right? Yeah. Like that was, <laughs> that's athletic. That's insane. Yeah. And like their whole job is to, is to make you not notice that they're there. It's yeah, because they're, but, they're not supposed to be interfering with the game. Right. Which is wild. <laughs> but so, and that's the thing, right. Is the smoother things go um, with rules changes and stuff like that. The more intuitive things are, the less you actually realize the nuts and bolts of what's being done. Right. Mm. Um, yeah. Because you don't have to like explain for, you know, an hour, you don't have to sit there and explain what makes dungeons work. They just work. Yes. You know? They work how you think they work. <laughs> they work how you think they work is one of the most fundamentally complicated things to do in magic rules. Like yeah. everybody, like we talk about the death trigger issue, right? Like when, yeah. when I was like, Hey man, how come I remember? And I'm, like, oh, yeah, my Alenda deck does this. And they're like, oh, the Alenda deck doesn't work the way you think it does. And I'm like, pardon? And in that, doesn't work the way you think it does into, oh, now it does work the way you think it does, was like years of work of yeah. trying to massage the rules, of trying to make it in such that how do you refer to the commander dying, going to the graveyard, and then having a state change to be able to go to the command? Blah, blah, blah. But it's not just like intuitive. Like, yeah. it's like when you look at original magic cards from Alpha or whatever, and they're like, on, this cannot be sacrificed on the way to the graveyard. And you're like, that's a dumb thing to yeah, say. Yeah, I know. But when there's no fundamental rule, you have to say things like, you can't sack it when it's dying. It's already dead. <laughs> yeah. Or like activating time vault in between turns. That was a, that was right? a big thing at one point. <laughs> was it because there was like a fraction of a second in between Yeah, there turns. was like this one phase that just existed. Like, <laughs> Where you could take infinite turns with Time Vault. And it required like eight erratas. Yeah, because, because every time, time they vault, tried. <laughs> time Vault is like one of the most complicated cards in the history of Magic. For all that it just says, take an extra turn when there's a thing yeah. on this, right? Like, what? Well, I always laugh. The, the example that I always use is um, Animate Dead, right? Oh, Everybody God. knows what Animate Dead does. It moves this card from from here to here, like move mm. target card eight inches on your play mat is what it does. But its rules text starts out when animate dead enters the battlefield. If it's on the battlefield, <laughs> that, that's the first like eight words of animate. Yeah, dead. And it's like enchant dead creature, but it's like, Oh, if yeah. I'm enchanting a dead creature, but then the creature's alive, what happens to the animate dead? It dies. Oh crap. But wait, no, yeah. no, no. Yeah. Or like if you stifle the, the, cause when animate dead enters the battlefield, it has a trigger that brings the creature back. And if you stifle that trigger, the animate dead stays on the battlefield and it's still enchanting the creature in your graveyard. Oh no. <laughs> it's, it's like actually a nightmare of a rules card. <laughs> that is such a terrible idea. But yeah. It's such a, but then if I go to my kid and say, yeah, you play animate dead and you get to bring your zombie back from the graveyard to play. Boom. Done. We all understand. Yeah. It. Yeah. Move it from here to here. Yeah. Everybody gets that. Right. But getting from here to there is phenomenally difficult. Yeah. Well, one thing that I, I realized the other day, um, here, let me ask you a question. Mm. I'm setting you up for, I'm setting you up on this. Okay. Um, mm. Basic mountain. What is a basic mountain's color identity? Basic mountain is colorless. Okay. It has a colorless color identity. No, because it's got a tap to add a red symbol on it in there. So it's got a red, no, but it does. So this, yes. this question actually came up on the MTG. What? Shout out to Andrew Weber, by the way. Ah. This, this came up on the MTG Facebook group. Um, and somebody asked this question, and it is deceptively difficult, okay? Yeah, but the reason we, being... The card is colorless. The basic so the lands card are is colorless. colorless. Okay, yes. but... Basic lands are colorless. But it's got... Depending on the text you use, there is a red mana symbol on the card, and per color identity rules... If it's got a mana symbol on the face of it that is not in reminder text, it is that color identity. Now, the question is, is that reminder text or not? So it's not reminder text, and it's also not rules text. It's an inherent ability, inherent or implicit. It starts with I. It's it's because when you grant something, the basic land type of mountain, it gains that ability. It is, it is a property of the basic land type. Okay? Uh. So, so that's the first thing. So uh, basic lands are they do have a colorless color identity but then the next logical question is can you include them in off-color decks 
So if they have a colorless color identity, can I put it in a mono black deck, my basic mountain? And the answer is no, but that's because there is a separate deck building restriction rule that says you can only include basic lands in the colors that match the color that they typically produce. Is that a rule? Really? There is a deck building rule in the comprehensive rules that says, um, even though basic lands have no color identity, they are colorless as far as color identity but goes. But the fundamental characteristic of basic land dash mountain is red generating. Therefore. It's, it's not even that it's, it just says when you're building a deck, you can only include mountains. If your co- if your commander has the corresponding um, color. I mean, I guess that's like, it's like kind of color identity, but not really. Um, but it's like one of those things where it's intuitive for everybody. They're like, yeah, you can't put mountains in a mono black deck. Why would you, you know? But then when you ask the question why, it's actually a little bit more complicated than that. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's just something that I realized last week because somebody asked this on the Facebook group and I was like, huh. I'm like, I know the answer to this. And then I go and I look and I'm like, oh, it's not that easy. It's actually a pretty complicated answer. That's... The answer is don't include mountains in your basic, in your mono black deck. Please take my word for it. <laughs> <laughs> but... But you can have a, a fetch land that grabs a swamp yes. and a mountain in yes. your deck. Yeah. Because trying to ban that or trying to restrict fetch lands to only be in the colors of things would end up having cascading effects upon so many cards that you do yep. not expect would suddenly be impacted by this that it would like yep. break land fundamental walk. things. Land walk. Land walk. You know, your, exactly. Your like zodiac, mountain walk. Your zodiac rooster like, would be white. <laughs> yeah right. <laughs> okay so we know how you got on the keg and anybody who wants to they can listen to the last time i had jim on and we talked about that um but how did they approach you for the rc because we knew at the beginning of last year or something sheldon and the rc came out and said and folks when i say sheldon it's not that sheldon is the king of the rc sheldon is just the face who makes a lot of the announcements because They've agreed that that's just a thing that he enjoys doing more than the other three do. So they're fine with it. So when I say Sheldon, it just kind of means shorthand for all four members of the RC, which if you don't know is Scott Larrabee, um, Gavin, uh, Duggan. yeah, Gavin Duke and uh, Toby Elliott and yeah. also Olivia Gover Hicks and Jim. Um, so, yeah, so those guys, we, they said we want to expand the RC and that was a monumental announcement because the first time in the decade plus that that's happened and they were like okay we're gonna and i was like is there any motion you who are you asking it's like we've we've talked to some people on the cag and we're talking to people offside the cag and i'm like all right cool Ooh, and they're like you'll find out and i'm like oh yeah. okay yeah sheldon reached out to me because sheldon and i talk fairly frequently um, sure about about a lot of the not magic stuff too. Actually, um, folks, I, it sounds that I'm bitter about this. I am absolutely not bitter. I'm thrilled with the decisions that were made, and I'm very happy where I am. But I'm just hamming it up for discourse. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Sheldon reached out to me and just wanted to sort of gauge my interest on whether it would be you know worthwhile to put my name forward. Mm. Um, this was a long time before. Um, it was like fairly shortly after I joined the keg, but. It was partially because Shelton and I have been talking a lot about uh, the direction of the format long term, like, mm. like, like decades, not like, not like what's happening next year kind yeah. of thing. And this this whole idea of of developing a roadmap for governing the format kind of played into it. Yeah, because Shelton's main thing when he was talking about this has been to work on the legacy of Commander, such that when he hands it off that there's hands who know what to do with running right. a format of this size scope and relationship with wizards and whatever. And that's like not yeah. just skills you can just pick up at the F and M, right? Like, well, okay. So that, that is, that is what I said. <laughs> um, you often hear um, you, or you have heard them talk a lot about how in how governing the format is a little bit closer to an art than a science, right? Or closer to an art than a science. Sure. The problem with that is we can't rely on recruiting and retaining people that already know how to run the format Mm -hmm. because that's, that's who it's governed by right now is people who already know how to do it. Yeah. It's like, Hey, guess what? The people who've been running commander have been running commander and they trained to run commander by making it. (laughs) Yes. So, so the question then becomes, how do you teach somebody to run the format? And the way that you teach somebody how to run the format is by putting all of the institutional knowledge that they've got on paper (laughs) and saying like, 
these are the things that we collectively know and agree on. And this is how we communicate that to other people when we build a constitution, them. right? Exactly. Exactly. It's, it's a governing, it's, it's a, it's a roadmap for how to, how to govern the format. And whenever, you know, there's a conflict between two rules, we refer back to that to determine how to resolve those, yeah. those disagreements, you know? And uh, yeah, so we've been talking a lot about that and it was, it was, uh, well, you know, from, from talking in CAG discussions, I've been asking questions a lot, like, how do we know whether we're doing a good job? How do we know whether it was a good idea to ban X card or unban X card or make this rules change? How do we know the format's in the right direction? Yeah. Is the format good right now or bad right now? How do we answer that question, right? What does the format look like when it's good? What does it look like when it's bad? And I think that these are all worthwhile questions to get to that end goal of being able to teach somebody how to run the format. Well, I mean, I think that when like every other deck is Golos, we know that the format is bad. Yeah. And then the question, <laughs> the question becomes, how do we know whether every other deck is Golos, right? Yeah. Um, so I think that there's a lot of, there's definitely a lot more questions than answers. And I don't, I don't pretend to have the answers to these. I'm just very good at asking questions. Right. Like, <laughs> one of the people that I suggested to them was Ben Wheeler, who was at the oh, time yeah, not too. on the case. <laughs> and because Wheeler has a distinction of, besides the rules committee, being the only other person who has basically created from scratch two different formats that are still yep. thriving and growing daily, right? And they're Between good Gladiator formats too. And Canlander. Yeah. And turning them from regional little, you know, pawns into a global format. It's like, he's maybe the only other person who's got this experience. Mm -hmm. And like, I think they have good reasons to make decisions of why they did as to putting him on the CAG as opposed to the, I'm glad they brought him into the fold though. Cause God, that guy's got understanding of how to do this in a way. Oh, yeah, he's he's brilliant. Ben Wheeler is brilliant. Absolutely. Um, there's, there's I mean, like he's no, of, no two ways about it. Yeah. Fundamental genius. And comes to, yeah. when it comes to understanding how players want to play. But yeah, like, so, so they came to interview you or like, when did they start the process? Oh, that's a good question. Was it like I'd after you made the announcement or had it kind of just been in discussion before? They, they like gauged my interest on it, um, several months before. Mm. And then, and then again, like shortly before they announced that they were like doing did this in earnest kind of thing. Mm. Uh, and then we had two rounds of interviews was it with the four then, of them? What's that? Was it with all four? Uh, yes. Yeah, it was with all four. Hmm. Which can be kind of intimidating. Yeah, I was going to say, like, that is, <laughs> yeah, what, what sorts of things did they ask you? Um, it was more, it was stuff like, you know, uh, what do you, um, what aspect of the format do you think is, is uh, most, like, sacrosanct? Hmm. What, what's a red line that we can't cross hmm. before it stops being commander? You know, like the whole the whole ship of Theseus kind of thing, right? Yeah. Like, at what point if you start stripping stuff away, what is the point where where it stops being commander and starts being something else, right? So that's a question we like struggle that. with quite a bit, actually. Yeah, I think it's a great question. Oh yeah, um, because like you know, I mean, you saw like the we, the post I made the other day. What is like if you strip down commander to its bare bones? What is it? Yeah, right. Yeah. Like, I I have some thoughts on that. <laughs> um, and actually I think some of this is missing from the, from the current philosophy document right now. I think it's three things. Mm. Okay. I think it is, um, stability. Mm. Um, I think it is, that's the first thing. Second thing is, um, sociality takes precedence over competition whenever the two are in conflict. Mm. Um, so we don't make, we don't make concessions on the social side of things to make a, a better competitive environment. Mm. but we will make sacrifices on the competitive side of things to make a better social environment. Mm. Um, so those two things are not often not in conflict, but when they're not in conflict, then it's fine. We don't have to make any sacrifices sure. for anything. Right. Um, and I think that the third thing is, um, hang on, was stability, sociality, and creativity is the last one. Mm. Um, so I think we want to, like, in, in my mind, we do a lot of things to encourage those. So there's a lot of, like, downstream effects. So um, if you look at all the different rules that are unique to Commander, like 100-card Singleton, that's designed to encourage creativity, Yes. right? You put more cards in your deck, you dig deeper on your list of, in your card pool. Um, higher life total, that's designed to be social, because mm. we don't want the games to be over before you can um, Hang out. socialize, right? Mm. Um uh, when we're talking about sociality over creativity, whenever the two are in conflict, that's why the ban list looks the way it does, right? So, like, 
you've got all of these things. And stability, Again, obviously, yeah. it's an internal format. You can use nearly every card you own. Yes, stability is. Um, I've got a, 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 you know, I've got a drawer full of commander decks right here, and I can pull out one that I built seven years ago mm -hmm. and play it today. Yep, my Grim Grin deck is more or less unchanged from when I built it. It's yep. still just fine. It does the thing. I can't do that in any other format. I really can't. Because Legacy, again, any any competitive format has some degree of like meta mm -hmm. trends where if I were to bring a Legacy deck to a tournament or whatever, which is where the primary place where I would play a Legacy or even my LGS if they had an LGS scene, mm -hmm. um, there are trends where a deck from seven years ago is just, you know, it's, it's probably going to get laughed out of the shop. Right? Sure because the priorities of those formats are different. Right. Um, modern, you know, Modern Horizons is shaking up modern to the point where it's practically a rotating format now, you know? Um, or maybe not a rotating format, but a format that has rotated. You know, it's you funny, know? like at the first return to Vegas that we had right after uh, Omicron, um, when we were all there with Egg Slut that never came. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it came and it was good. <laughs> it was, uh, still fantastic. But yeah, like I had brought uh, my Modern Elves deck with the intention of playing it. And I hadn't touched it in like two, three, four years or something. And then I was about to sit down and I realized, oh, I can't because literally this deck will just fold to any of these like Fury or whatever random elementals from yeah. Modern Horizons 2 or just like it will not, like the stuff I have in my sideboard isn't Plague the engineer. thing that cares about, right? Plague Engineer? Yeah, Ooh. Plague Engineer. <laughs> <Woof>. <laughs> 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 yeah, but it's just like... It turns out that, yeah, you're right. Like Commander, I can, I mean, I was on Elder Dragon's Social Club for, uh, with Lo Loading Ready Run uh, a few weeks ago, and I got to, I got a card, the um, the Grixis deck that had, um, that had True Name Nemesis in it. Uh, oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, uh, whatever Nekusar. it was. Uh, Nekusar? Was it Nekusar? Um, yeah, it might have been Nekusar. Uh, yeah, it was, was probably it? Nekusar. yeah. Or maybe it was like the cast Jaleva. It was Jaleva. It was Jaleva, not cast. Yeah. It was Jaleva. But yeah, it was Jaleva. And like that's a deck from the second gen of commander decks. And it was able to hold its own against like Prosper, right? Like yeah. or like Ur Dragon or just modern precon decks. You can't pull a precon from sh like a Tempest block and expect to win anything today. You know, it's like Yeah. So yeah, I think you're right. Like my fundamental, I think if I was going to sum up commander is less philosophical and now i feel like i should be aiming for where you've been going but like mine is more like the format is 100 card singleton because yep. you want variability you want um uh, more chaotic hands you want more like creativity and like you less consistency i want it to be more inconsistent sure. and more like variable you've got a direction in which to build your deck via your commander which gives you borders within to play while still having the variability you're looking for and the fact that the life total is 40 and um that it's a socially focused game right yeah and i think you can you can if you if you took each one of those one step further yeah you would arrive at that philosophy i think i think what right? you said is very much where i would also end up if i was to actually sit down and like write it down and I think That's I think right. what you just said, like the next step, is literally what I just said. Yeah, pretty it, much. It's the same. It's the same thing, put in a different way, you know. Um, but yeah, like I, I don't really see anything about stability. People don't talk about stability very often. And, yeah, but and that's I think such it's a fundamental of part of Commander things. that, like, for sure, you can have your pet deck, you can foil it out, and it'll still work. Yeah, and, and that, like how many like how many cards have been banned in Commander in the past five years? More than quite a few, actually, comparatively to the history of Commander. Right. But, but even then, compared to the number of cards that have been released. Or like, compared to the number of cards that were just banned in standard. Right? Yeah. Like, like, that's the thing. What That's why I like to tell people, like, look, we take it very, very seriously. Banning Commander is an insanely difficult decision to make because we're stripping not only, like, a bad card out of the format, but we're taking people's decks away. We're taking away, like, this thing that they've built up, they've built an identity around, they've built a kind of thought around. And those are the sort of decisions that we need to be judicious about before it becomes too late. Because, like, if somebody becomes, like, very enmeshed in their... Like, Golos, there were some great, fundamentally cool Golos decks that were just not going to work because that card is too good for everything. But yep. we let it go for so long that you ended up causing a lot more pain than if they had realized initially, like, yo, this needs to go in, like, you know, one cycle, not like a year. 
Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. that's so it goes. I mean, that's your fault now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's that's the kind of thing that um, that I'm I'm working actually that that concept that um, that three sort of pronged concept is something that's factored really heavily into this document that I'm writing. Um, and I definitely want to classify all of the things that we're doing mm. because like we do a lot of things, right? We've got like, and, and not even just in terms of like the rules that we create in the format, like color identity is a rule. It's intended to encourage creativity. It's intended to uh, encourage creative expression. Um, but we do a lot of things like the CAG is something that we do. What is the CAG intended to accomplish? Right. It's a good question sometimes. Yeah. It's intended to, to say, you know, if we're trying to encourage sociality, we want people out there saying, how social is the format right now, <laughs> right? Like, how are people using the cards that are being released? Are they using them competitively? Are they using them to express themselves? Are they, you know, is there a lot of variety? All this kind of stuff. Um, or things like uh, the Rules Committee Discord, right? That mm-hmm. is something that we do. What is the point of that, right? So I want to be able to look at everything that we do through the lens of what it what it actually accomplishes mm-hmm. in the format, Right. Um, because I think that that's the piece that's missing from the philosophy right now. Like we've got a, a general idea of what we want the format to be, but we're not looking at the things that we're doing in terms of whether that's good or bad for what we want. Right. Cause there's a lot of inertia. There's a lot of it's institutional kind of just habits that we've built up from, you know, commander being around for so long and having the same people running it for so long means that they've got like tracks that they're used to walking down. And so shaking up the RC and having you and Olivia come on and building and trying to understand what it is that's going on so that we can build from it and move beyond it or even just help people understand why this is. Because Commander has gone through such a huge growth spurt in the past three years. Insanely, like it's been geometrically larger, like expansion of number of players we have. And there's a lot of people who are like, a lot of pros are coming in. A lot of other people are coming in. They're going like, why is this the way it is? And yeah. we don't really have good answers, except it's the way it is. Well, and see, I think that that's um, in terms of talking to like, let's say, let's say talking to a pro. Mm. We, we know, we know that there's lots of pros that know a lot about magic. And I think a lot of them are coming in, you know, saying, why is this the way it is? And genuinely wanting to help, but not having the foundational knowledge of, of what are we trying to do? <laughs> sure. <laughs> you know, There's and if we were to share with them the, the problem statement of, you know, this is kind of what we're trying to push against. They may have valuable insights onto how to help us accomplish those things. And likewise for R&D, when they're designing cards, if we're able, better able to communicate what our goals are for the format, it's less likely that they're going to produce stuff that directly works against it. Yes. You know? I think one of the biggest problems, like, and I've brought this up with Wizards before, is I think one of the big problems was originally in like 2014, 2015, 2016, when they started putting a focus on Commander more properly, they had all of their standard dev team going out there and making Commander cards. And those are guys who are like ex-Pro Tour players or people who have been focused on yeah. standard and modern for years Brilliant. and years and years. And have like, and they look at the format like, hey, you know what? This format's all like seven drops and eight drops. We need to have something like faster and something like more efficient than the lower end. What if we made, I don't know, Dockside or, or, or yeah. like other things like that, a true name nemesis type of stuff. And you end up with people who mean well and who are designing well, but are designing for something that is not what we are making. Right. Yeah. Like they're designing for a, a format that doesn't exist, but by making these cards, by creating like partners, by creating like all this sort of thing, we get this we've got this problem now where it's like, Oh, the, the assumptions that we made when it was just a fan run format that nobody cared about don't hold when the people who are making the cards for it don't understand what language we're speaking. And if we don't have some way to communicate to them, like, no, this is what commander should be. This is what like we're hoping to make it. This is what we want it to be. If we tell them that, then we get cool weirdo commanders. We get cool things that are more three mono rocks instead of two mono rocks. Like, less arcane signets and more midnight clocks, right? Like, yeah. or just like all of these weird, obscure, like, like Jedit, uh, Ojan and the pirate, who is like a legends matter card is like something really yeah. cool. All these suddenly niche specific commanders instead of just generic Tulane value. Yeah. But only because we've told them that and we need to be, and I think you're 100% correct when you say we need to be forthright and that needs to be our new goal. That needs to be the thing that we work on is creating 
a documentation or some kind of easily understood methodology so that the people who play and the people who make the cards know what we want and can also understand it and look if they don't like it that's fine but at least they know what it is yeah like i my my ideal goal my, my ideal vision for the format and even though i realize this is never going to happen because we have disparate motivations is i would love for the uh studio x design philosophy to be in lockstep with the commander rules committee philosophy i would love to, for there to be no daylight in between those i would love for us to define success the same ways mm. i would love for us to say you know to, to be able to celebrate the same things <laughs> Yeah. But right now, well, I think what we've got is there is a bit of daylight in there. Um, and so what I want is to be able to define that that sort of daylight area in terms of these are some lines where if you cross them, you can expect the card to get banned mm -hmm. um, so that they're making informed decisions when they create cards rather than just sort of saying, I know this is pushing the boundary a little bit. Let's put it out there and see how it goes. You know, yeah, I don't that's... want that guess and check. That I don't want that guess and check. I want them to be able to predict it fully. Yeah. Or better still, they come up with a card and they come to you before they print it. And then yeah. if it gets stopped before it starts, then we don't have a problem. Because that was one of the things that I remember when I talked to Aaron Forsyth about this. And he was like, look, we'll make cards because we trust that the Commander Rules Committee will catch us if we're going to jump too far. And I'm like, that's that's true. But at the same time, what if we didn't? Like, yeah. what if we didn't just jump blindly in, ruin the format for three months and wait for somebody else to fix it? Because like, it, that's not a, that's not a frictionless cost. That's not like, yeah. like there's actual, like there's an actual cost to doing this. If we ban yeah. it, we're getting a customer, uh, like a customer relations hit. We're getting the customer confidence hit and people are like, they're not going to be mad at wizards. They're going to be mad at us. Because we've yeah. taken away a really fun and cool toy. Paradox Engine is one of my favorite cards ever. It is miserable. There's no way that should have ever been made. I love Paradox Engine. On the day that it got previewed, I said, I'll, I'll find a screenshot of it. <laughs> but on the day that it got previewed, I sent to our Spike Feeder chat. I'm like, this card's getting banned. There's no no way that this card can stay legal. Yeah, or even positive I off, prefix. I held off on buying it for like a year. Mm. And then it was like a month after I bought one, I bought a masterpiece one and then it got banned. And I'm like, well, I knew it was coming. I shouldn't have done that. Yeah. But it was just like, like I was just like that with Prophet of Crufix. I had gotten the fancy full art one from the limited set or whatever they come out. And I'm like, yeah, I can finally build a Simic deck. And they're like, Prophet of Crufix is broken as hell and we're banning it. And I'm like, yeah, but that's what I want is that, that reaction of, I see this card. I know for sure that that's going to get banned in my heart of hearts. I want um, the the game playing public to be able to make that prediction after reading our body of knowledge. And I want Wizards R&D to be able to make that assessment as well, to yeah. say, this is predictably bannable, you right. know? Like Lutri, or, or we, everybody bannable. looked at it, and if you ignore the otter part, you look at it and you're like, obviously that is not for Commander. Yeah, not okay. Um, and so, like, there are going to be situations. This is why when I say that there, there are disparate goals and there's always going to be daylight. We're never going to be in lockstep with with, um, yeah. with Wizards. Because, I mean, look, they, their goal is to sell cards. Their goal is to make new yes. cards. We cannot shackle their creativity. They've got yeah. to try weird things, right? Fine. Yep. But at the same time, there's also just, there's weird things for the sake of being weird and weird things that are going to just destabilize the format. And, like, yeah. we, and, like, there's ways to be wrong that are less impactful, too, right? Like, um, <laughs> like it, this is something that partners glenn in? jones and i glenn jones and i were talking about um uh, partners specifically it's funny that you mentioned partners glenn and i were talking about this on twitter recently because somebody put in a uh somebody put out a tweet it was a poll saying like what's what's been mo most detriment detrimental to cdh and the options were i think partners dockside thassa's oracle and underworld breach and uh so i said partners and Glenn says, well, is it is it partners per se, or was it like the specific 10 C16 partners? 15. And I'm like, was it 15? Yeah. Yeah. And so I'm like, well, it was specifically those 10 partners because they were overtuned uh, and they invalidated like just by themselves. Like I, <laughs> this is something that some people know about me. If you've been following the Spike Feeder since the beginning, you know that I'm a big fan of Nin the Pain artist. Mm. It was like an is it infinite mana like it played Paradox Engine. It, it was like cool exactly card. what you think of this. It it's just like big mana, draw lots of cards, hard control, stacks, like Blood Moon, back to basics. Um, 
And when Thrasios came out, everybody was just like, why are you still playing Nin? Thrasios is just strictly better even by itself. Mm. And it kind of is. And so when you think about it, like it, it, like there are lots of games where they allow you to like decentralize um, your, your avatar or your, like your player, like in Heroes of the Storm, you can play the Lost Vikings and you can play three characters in a MOBA instead of one, mm. but you don't get three whole characters. You get like one third of a character three times, mm. right? Um, or like you can play Ice Climbers in Smash Brothers, right? And you get two half characters instead of one character. Right. Um, and, you know, if partners were consistently tuned to be worth half a card, it wouldn't be uh, as big of a deal that you start with an extra card in your opening hand. And yep. like all of these complaints that people have about partners, it wouldn't be that big of a deal if each one was a little underwhelming. Yeah, like I think you know? the single colored partners that they ended up with in uh, Commander Legends were so much more balanced because they were either more expensive or they were more narrow in their focus and they had a much like a much less brutal effect than just the generically good card. Like Thrasios and Timna, nutter butters, even just yeah. unto themselves. Yeah, or Thrasios by itself best infinite mana commander ever printed yeah, like, like up until that point like, in the game if, you, if that card had tapped think about how different that would be, it would be it, well it would be you know what it would be it would be una or it would be nin if it tapped right yeah. those were the two infinite mana commanders at the time um and like that that was the baseline and thrasios was like an order of magnitude better by itself as a simic commander right <laughs> it's it's before you even the card of all anything. time right yeah <laughs> it's a coiling oracle with steroids but um yeah. yeah like i don't know i mean i think that there is a lot of work to be done and i think that wizards has gotten the idea i think they understand that they need to be more less proactive in terms of just throwing things out there and hoping we catch it and i think having like the casual play team there to actually start and be like a first level filter is a great idea it needs to be more than that, but it's a great place to catch the the dock sides before they come to port, right? Like um, that, because like some of these things, like I remember I was talking to some of the designers and they were like, yeah, we aimed this card to be hitting the higher tiered, uh, you know, higher power play. And I'm like, okay, you did. You did by a lot. But also the resounding roll down from that is that because Commander doesn't have a meta and the Commander doesn't have like, you know, decks that are played here, all of these cards roll down to every tier and they're destabilizing all the tables, not just the top tier ones where they can deal with it. It's like when Dranith Magistrate, right? People are like, oh, you know, you hear a lot of people just like, Dranith needs to be banned. It's broken. It's off people from commanders and something like, at like the average tier table, people will sort to plowshare it or wrath it or one of the 38 different ways to remove a creature. It'll be fine. At the tables where you're playing hyper-tuned decks that do not have room for those slots, that card's a problem for you. And guess what? Yeah. That's exactly where it should be. It should be yeah. a problem for you because you built a deck <laughs> to fight that challenge. But the funny thing is, like, if Dockside Extortionist is 100, it could have been an 80 and still been the best ritual ever printed for CDH. <laughs> Undoubtedly. That card is... I don't <laughs> like, know what... I mean, like, the card is broken. The card is they, fundamentally broken. Yeah, they they could have they could have pulled back a lot and still way overshot the mark on efficiency. Yeah, like, like yeah, a fixed oxide, even one that just comes into play and gives you like I don't know, th one for each player that you're playing against. That's yeah. still going to be well. Like, what's the baseline, right? Like, right of flame, right? What <laughs> yeah. what is what does two mana get you in a ritual? Three mana. Yeah, and it drains, and it drains when the steps change, <laughs> <laughs> and a body on top of that. In the body, right? Yeah, <laughs> the body is not. It's not a lie. It's there. It still acts like a thing. That means you can yeah. flicker it. You can. Uh, anyways, we don't need to. We don't need to yeah. litigate that. Yeah, we, everybody knows Dockside Extortionist is good, but yeah, like so. The one thing that I really want is when when R and D looks at this stuff. Mm. I don't just want them to know like. Um, you know, as a blanket rule, like one of the core things about Commander is like 100 card singleton. But what I want them to know is why do we care about 100, 100 card singleton? Mm -hmm. So that when they inevitably push into that as design space, that they do it responsibly. I mean, they've already um, done it, right? Like partners, yeah, they do. partners companions, is that, companions. Is all that. This other it's like, look, dude, there's a reason. And it's not just that's the amount of sleeves that comes in a packet, right? Like, yeah. Um, You've got to lead the, like. There's got to be some load-bearing pillars of the format that give it identity, that give it 
a reason to be that's not just this is my singleton vintage deck right like it's you can you've got to build ways like they've started doing that with modal spells and like other things like that modal spells are great do that for commander give me more choices for my one card like make this one slot worth more to me but don't be yeah. like here's now your 101 slot here's your 102 yeah. like you can't well, but do you know that you know the the phrase um oh what is it cutting the end off the roast or cutting the end off the ham yeah that comes up a lot in vegetarian hindu cultures <laughs> it's like a it's it's like a, um um it's a phrase in business quite a bit and it's like it's something that we do that we don't understand why like it's it's a it's kind of a parable mm. you know and it's like when i learned how to cook I, my mom always cut the end off of the roast or cut the end off the ham and so now i do it because my mom always did it but then you find out that the reason why the person did it is because they didn't have a roasting pan that was big enough to fit the roast that right, they want. And so right, they cut right, the end right, off right, to right. fit. But that problem that you're addressing isn't necessarily applicable anymore. So you don't want to just mimic that or you don't just want to right. um, make these decisions. Assuming well, that that's, that's a deep the philosophy goal. right there. There's yeah. a lot to that. Like we perform this ritual the way it is because yes. something happened, some went to do it. Mm, yeah mm. and so so like that's what i want is is i don't want like r d to look at you know the fact that um we banned hull breacher and take the wrong message away from it i want there to be a very clear message to why that was banned and where it conflicts with the philosophy of the format the, the experience that we're trying to cultivate yeah, like, why hull breacher and not notion the uh, thief right like exactly because breacher right? is broken um yeah. notion thief totally fine card by the way it's fine it's fine hull breacher is not fine i love adding colors to cards i really do yeah i, I love adding colors and i love adding more pips yes like, like that i want to see more like make someone pay five white mana to do something like think about that. how much better like how much better would smothering tides be if it was instead of like three and a white if it was like two and white white or three yeah. or like you know one white 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 it would be well, way better this is actually, I think that tangentially, this is one of the issues with, um, we talked a lot about, when we talked about Golos, one of the things we talked about quite a bit was um, five color commanders that don't cost five colors. Yes. And part of that is, I think that it would even be fine if you had like a five color commander, um, like let's say they they come out with a new Joda and they want it to be five color identity, but they don't want it to be like, um, you know, a, a Wooberg casting sure. cast. And this is like, Heads up to Watsy R and D. I'm I'm not like I'm talking. If you're listening to this right now, <laughs> I'm like spitballing a card here. So plug your ears. Um, yeah, like I think that a five color card is fine if it's like red, red, blue, blue, blue with green, black, white in the rules text. Mm. Right. The color density is still there mm -hmm. because I think what the problem that you run into with a card like Kenrith that's four white is that it's trivially easy to make a lot of colorless mana in the first early turns of the game. Mm -hmm. And so what four white does that blue, blue, red, red, red doesn't is um, it comes down easily one or two turns earlier, sometimes three turns earlier, right? Yeah. Like Kenrith with a soul ring, you can cast that on turn three just by making your land drops, right? And it doesn't matter what land drops basically, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. Um, whereas it's a lot harder to hit red, red, blue, blue, blue on turn three. Yeah. Like Niv Mizzet's not coming out on turn three. Yeah. So like, like a red, red, blue, blue, blue is a lot easier to cast from a, a fixing standpoint, um, than Wooberg might be. Um, but it doesn't come down as fast because the confluence of cards in a deck, like all of the, the different permutations of cards that you can draw, to make colorless mana, mm. there's a lot more of those scenarios that result in four white on turn three than there are like red, red, blue, blue, blue. For sure. You know? So I really like density of cards, like ultimatums. I love the idea of mm -hmm. making very powerful end game effects, just gating them behind tons of color pips. Right. I love or that like design. the new like the invokes from uh, Kamigawa. Yeah, love like them. invoke despair or whatever. One black, 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 black. Yep. Right. Like yeah. Or the, okay. uh, unnatural growth. Oh yeah, is it like the green enchantment? That yeah. has four pips in it. I love that. Yeah, like, it's great. And that card is also hella fun. <laughs> yeah, and I think that like it encourages people to play fewer colors in their deck to more reliably hit those pips. Yeah, I think um, I think they can. I think that there was a point of design where they they were trying too hard to be efficient, and that in doing so they forgot that 
cards can have more than one pip in them. Yeah, right? like, like Hall Reacher could have been blue, 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 and it probably wouldn't have been as bad. Dockside could have been red, 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 and it wouldn't have been as bad. Um, if you want to commit to it, it would. It requires you to commit to it, right? Yeah. You can't go like turn one. Um, mountain, I think that's the ultimate summary here <laughs> is that like you need to make people commit. You can't just give them the ability to play everything for free or like frictionless. Like part of what makes commander work is that there is friction that we have to make choices that in playing a green and white deck, that means I don't get this blue effect, right? Yes. Like yeah, if I'm playing Sithis and I'm not playing Tuvasa, that means I, there's a whole flock of blue auras and enchantments and things that I just don't get to have. And yeah. that's fine. Cause that's the trade-off that I'm making here. And it's, it's hard because Commander is such a fundamentally multicolored format because we want to play every card ever. We want to play all of our favorite cards from the history of the game. But we got to not have just five-color soup or four-color soup. And that's kind of where 2016 to 2020 led us, right? Like, yeah, we got to this point where we were having the ability to play literally any card and they were all really good. Yeah. That's a lot. Like... I, I don't know. I really like playing lower color decks. I was just listening to Commander Sphere, um, their like um, penultimate episode where they talk about how their philosophies have changed. Mm -hmm. They like talk about their philosophy at the beginning of the podcast and again at the end. And both Rachel and Dan um, said something that really resonated is that they're playing a lot more lower color decks lately mm -hmm. because it's more of a challenge. The decks um, tend to feel more um, flavorfully what they are. Um, and you dig deeper into the card pool and you find like this, this deck that I was showing Obosh from earlier, um, it's my Torwaki deck and every card is in it is a one drop. <laughs> it's Torwaki and Obosh, the new Torwaki. And I'm digging like there's, there's like 2,300 Rakdos one drops in the game, including artifacts. <laughs> and, uh, so I looked through all of them. I just spent like four hours looking through. I think Rakdos my favorite thing in, in magic is forcing a, a restriction on myself and then trying to find the weirdo card from Mercadian masks that yeah. is exactly perfect for what I'm trying to do. Right. Yeah. Like I, <laughs> there are cards in this deck. Like one card that came up was Grizzly Sigil from new Comet, new Capenna. Um, it's an <laughs> uncommon. I don't know if you've ever seen that card before, but it's a one mana sorcery. It's a one black and it's got casualty one. So you can sacrifice a, uh, a creature of power one or greater to copy it when you cast it. And it says, uh, deal three damage to target creature that was dealt damage this turn and you gain three life. Uh, and then if it hasn't been dealt damage this turn, you deal one damage instead and gain one life. <laughs> um, it's awful. The card is like straight up bad. It's a bad card. But in Torwaki with Obosh out, it deals like 20 damage. <laughs> <laughs> and then because you're in red, you can just fork it. <laughs> yeah, it's like unreasonable. Well, it forks itself. It's got casualty, right? Oh, right. It so, does. That's so what happens? <laughs> so what happens? Because you've got two replacement effects with Torwaki and Obosh. One, the Torwaki effect adds one damage to it, like Torbrand does. And then the uh, Obosh effect doubles it. So the opponent gets to choose what, what order they get applied. So you would generally, the opponent would double it and then add one. Hmm. But you cast it, you casualty it. So you sack some one drop, whatever, like Bomat Courier or something like that. You copy it. It triggers Obosh, or tr sorry, triggers Torwaki. Torwaki deals two damage to something with its own trigger. Hmm. That satisfies the condition for Grizzly Sigil for the creature having taken damage. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so you can be like, I'm going to target your, um, I don't know, Protean Hydra. Protean Hydra? Sure. It's the one that There's doubles. There's one, yeah. Yeah, one of those, some whatever. Let's let's target your uh, 2020, your Colossified Commander. Hmm. Um, Torwaki deals two damage to it, and you gain two life because Torwaki has lifelink. And then um, the first grizzly, grizzly Sigil happens. It gets doubled from Obosh, and then you add one. So it deals... Or sorry, the Torwaki trigger gets doubled from Obosh. Let's do oh, yeah. four damage first. Then the Grizzly Sigil happens, and it deals seven damage, and you gain three life. <laughs> and then the second one happens, and it deals another seven damage, and you gain another three life. <laughs> so it, it deals 18 damage, and you gain 10 life for one black man and <laughs> sacrificing a creature. So like that kind of stuff, it, it like, I, I love, That's why we love, play. love, love. When you take that card out of that specifically overly contrived context <laughs> that you put it in deliberately and you put it in any other deck, somebody rips it off the top with a tally. 
and they they look like this and like why do you play this card this sucks (laughs) like maybe in your deck (laughs) (laughs) well yeah exactly like in hang on one second because i've got this pile of cards that's on my desk right now um for instance there's a card from mercadian masks or strong whatever this stronghold called mind games Mind Games is okay. an instant for one that says tap target artifact creature or land, buy back two in a blue. This card is unplayable in EDH, except yeah. in my Nira deck, where paying a one mana instant lets me then turn it into my, like, you know, Consecrated Sphinx or into my Niv Visit or into any, anything. <laughs> and you're like, because, oh. like, there's so many times where I'm like, I'm just going to play this one card pay one mana whatever and like what does it do it doesn't matter it's going on the bottom of the deck anyway yeah yeah it doesn't well <laughs> i play a lot of cards like that in my vile smasher deck and uh my my big thing with my vile smasher deck is i look at cards like soul ring and i'm like man this card is not good enough to be that cheap it better be donking something for a lot so instead of soul ring i play causal x channeler which is a five mana four four that taps for two colorless. <laughs> what the hell? Because it hits people for five off of Vile Smasher, and Soul Ring only hits people for one. That's and so a lot of the time I'm casting these I love spells every and I'm part like, of that sentence. And people are like, "What? Like, what does that card do?" I'm like, "It doesn't matter. Take eight. <laughs> <laughs> it, it nugs you. Is what it does." Okay, Jim. Um, yeah. Wow. We've blown past the hour here. <laughs> and uh, I have to go pick up my kid. So thank you so much for joining me. And I'm really glad to see that you're on the RC. It's honestly like I could not have picked a better pair than you and Olivia. Um, and I think that the format is going to be in good hands given the way this, if this knowledge transfer can happen and we can get this going. We do need to build more. We need to build a bigger community. We need to build more um understanding of what commander is and what it isn't but i think that you're the right people to do it so i hope so yeah (laughs) and if not well uh there's always spike on the mic yeah really but okay so with that if folks wanted to find you and bother you about cards that i can't ban but you can (laughs) where should they go Right now, best place to get a hold of me is on Discord. Uh, if you hop on the Spike Feeders Discord, there's a link on every single one of our videos to our Discord. Uh, and I have a specific channel. If you want to talk about Rules Committee related stuff um, or stuff with the direction of the format, that's the best place to go. Uh, I'm off Twitter personally right now, but uh, we still have the Spike Feeders account. Um, so if you want to get a hold of the Spike Feeders, you can get a hold of us there. And of course, uh, Spike yeah, Feeders have their own Discord. YouTube channel. Yeah, we got one of those. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And of course, you can probably find you at the the RC Discord as well. Yeah, yeah, you can tag me there too. I'm I'm available most days there. Cool. And as always, my friends, you can find me at, at Gear Puri Gears. You can find uh, this podcast anywhere podcasts are told, or at Cool Stuffing on Tuesdays, or at YouTube on Thursdays. Thank you to my editor EK, and also I live on the Commander Discord as well. Um, but as always, my friends, it's not magic without the gathering, and we will see you next time. Bye.